Good evening. I'm going to kick things off now. I've got a few people dribbling in the back still, but I think it's time to start. My name is Lewis Blackwell. I'm the strategy director at the Built Environment Trust, which runs the building center. And uh, I was the curator of the exhibition upstairs, Super Material. Um, so it's my great pleasure to invite you uh, to the evening, uh, which is one of the presentations in the Super Material series, which is very kindly sponsored by Tremo, which makes it all possible to have free tickets. Um, so tonight's session, Why Matter Matters, Can the Built Environment Better Respond to Material Innovation? I think we all know the answer to that question, which is, of course it can. And they really want to find out you know, what could we do, what's going to happen next. So we have some fantastic speakers. I'm going to uh, introduce each one of them. They're going, to be, they're going to be in that order. There's no particular logic to that order, but then there'll be no logic to another order. So I don't think so. Tell me if there would have been, but um, we're going to go with that one. Uh, there's a vague logic in that Matthew goes last, and Matthew can perhaps show us his structure upstairs afterwards as a kind of close causal connection. Uh, but we are going to have a... Did that just stop working? It's back. Yeah. Um, we are going to have a panel discussion, and then we'll go upstairs and have a look at things. But um, that's the order of proceedings. Uh, so we're going to begin with... Uh, we'll take questions at the end as well, so try to, try to keep the flow of the presentations first. Uh, the... Um, first speaker, I'll put my glasses on for this. Anna is a materials scientist and engineer at UCL Chemistry, a features writer for the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining, and she's currently an engineering doctorate candidate for researching hydrogen storage materials for portable applications. And Anna's going to discuss the potential of smart materials and their role in creating more sustainable, adaptable, and even self healing cities. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm, tonight I'm not going to be talking about anything to do with my PhD, um, but this is a, a subject that is of a particular interest to me. So um, tonight I'm going to be talking about smart cities, specifically smart materials, um, and how we can use smart materials in the built environment to make smart cities in the future. So, okay, what's a smart material? If you've had a look at the um, exhibition upstairs, you might think that, well, all these materials look actually really smart to me. But the official definition of a smart material is one which has a property, which might be its shape or its colour, um, and that property changes in response to a stimulus. Um, that stimulus might be light levels or moisture levels or even um, applied force. And when that stimulus is removed again, the material returns back to its original state. Now, smart materials can do all sorts of things. Um, in general, you can divide them up into about six categories. Um, they can colour change, sense, they can be moving, heating or cooling, self-healing and phase changing, so that means freezing and melting. Um, as usual with materials, um, although we've invented these cool new materials, nature actually got there before us. Um, so a pine cone is a really great example of a smart material. This is a smart material which changes its shape in response to increased moisture levels. So when a pine cone is wet, then it closes up and when it's dry, then it opens out. Um, and flowers as well are an excellent example of a natural smart material because these morph in response to light levels to track the sun across the sky. Um, actually, even in our own technological history, smart materials aren't even that new. Um, the lime mortar in the pyramids of Giza is actually um, known to be self-healing, so it can heal small cracks that develop inside. Um, but in terms of a scientific approach to smart materials, they only really came about um, in 1880, discovered by um, Pierre Curie, husband to Marie, and his brother Jacques. Um, they discovered that if you compress a quartz crystal, then an electric charge appears on either side. And a year later, they actually discovered that you can do the reverse as well. So if you apply a voltage to a quartz crystal, then it physically deforms. Um, and this is, they called this effect the piezoelectric effect, piezo, the Greek for squash, um, and electro is from the Greek for electron, electron rather, um, which was the Greek for amber, actually, which was an ancient source of electric charge. Um, so the discovery of a smart material by Pierre and Jacques um, 
sort of brought about a revolution in materials design and materials engineers started to rethink their entire approach to materials design. Um, today we have hundreds of different smart materials, there are millions of patents involving smart materials um, and there are so many applications that I can't even begin to, um, to start to describe them so I'm going to narrow it down to the built environment and three applications in particular. Energy harnessing, energy efficiency and maintenance of buildings. Um, so let's look at energy harnessing. Actually, there's an example upstairs of a smart material um, in the built environment for energy harnessing, um, if you have a look. And it is smart um, uh, floorboards, which harness the energy of footsteps. Now, these contain similar materials to that first piezoelectric crystal. Um, and uh, what they do is uh, they will um, produce an electric charge when footsteps walk over them. And in the built environment in the future, we could see these in roads, we could see them in footways or um, uh, bridges in order to harness the power of passing vehicles or passing footsteps. But how do piezoelectric crystals actually work? Well, the whole secret to it is an asymmetric crystal. So when the material um, isn't stressed, then it looks something like this. This is just a reduced version, um, six different atoms in there. And ordinarily, um, a positive charge on one atom will be negated by a negative charge from a nearby atom. But when the material is either pulled or squashed, um, these atoms move, and they move in such a way that then those charges are then unable to cancel each other out. And so if you multiply this effect over the whole crystal, actually what you get is a measurable voltage, and it's that measurable voltage that we can use to power street lights or to power an electric sensor in a futuristic home. Next, let's look at energy efficiency of buildings and smart materials. Um, Different coloured roofs can have a huge effect on the actual internal temperature of a building or of the city. So a dark coloured roof is going to absorb a lot more of the sun's energy and therefore make the building warmer. And conversely, a light coloured roof will make the building cooler because it reflects a lot of the sun's energy. Um, now, a thermochromic paint, which is a smart material, would change colour in response to increased and decreased temperatures. So on a hot day, the material would be white, and so it would reflect a lot of the sun's energy. And on a cold day, it would be black, so it would um, absorb a lot of the sun's energy in order to temperature regulate inside buildings without any kind of human interaction or um, heating or air conditioning or that kind of thing. Similarly, you can do this with photochromic windows. So th this is a smart material that a lot of people are, are familiar with already in photochromic sunglasses. So those sunglasses that darken in response to increased light levels. So these sorts of materials would um, be able to regulate temperature very, very well inside a building. But the coolest example um, of temperature regulating materials that I've seen are smart phase change materials. Now, when a material melts, it actually uh, takes in heat from its environment and when it, uh, when it solidifies then it gives out that <coughs> heat. So these um, clever materials can be inserted into floors or into walls or ceilings in buildings in order to better regulate the temperature so that there aren't huge fluctuations in temperature which uses up a lot of energy in terms of heating and cooling the interior environment. So finally, building maintenance. This sounds like quite a boring topic, but actually the materials involved are really cool. This is self-healing concrete. Um, so like the Pyramids of Giza, um, this is a more modern version of that, um, and it actually contains embedded bacteria. Now, ordinarily, these bacteria lie dormant in the material. They don't do anything. But when a crack appears in concrete, um, those bacteria become, uh, uh, become uh, subjected to moisture from the air and moisture from rain. Um, and this moisture activates the bacteria and they start to consume food, which is also embedded in the material. Um, this food is calcium lactate, which is um, that sort of white stuff that you get on cheese when you've left it in the fridge for too long. Um, for some reason, these bacteria love it. Um, so they'll eat that food and they excrete limestone. And that limestone then acts to fill in the crack in the concrete. So self-healing concrete can be embedded in buildings or bridges or other infrastructure, um, and it could save us millions of pounds in terms of um, building maintenance every year. This sort of application actually would be very good also in an in a area where there's a lot of seismic activity and buildings are subject to quite a lot of stress and strain. Um, 
and this is another example of a smart material that could be involved in that sort of a system, um, in active vibration control. So when an earthquake hits a building in an area where, um, where they're quite prone to earthquakes, active vibration and control can help to protect the building and absorb a lot of vibrations from earthquakes. Um, electro re uh, electro-rheological materials can help with this. So these are materials where they're fluid, um, and ordinarily they contain particles that are randomly distributed in that fluid. Um, when an electric field is applied, these particles all stack up into a chain, and this modifies the, um, the viscosity of that fluid, such that it becomes much more viscous when those particles are all aligned. So if this was embedded inside a live feedback loop involving sensors, um, these materials would be able to mitigate the effects of of earthquakes in real time to react to the exact frequencies of those earthquakes that were being experienced by that building. So that's just a brief overview of the sorts of smart materials that we might start seeing in the built environment. But you might ask, why don't we have them today if they were invented over 100 years ago? Well, there's a few reasons. Um, the response times can be quite slow. The materials can be delicate or quite unstable. They sometimes d exhibit diminishing performance over time, so with multiple cycles, then their effects get less and less reliable. Um, they can be quite difficult to incorporate into working devices. The switch threshold can be difficult, so the light levels or the temperature might not be very easy to, to tailor. Um, some of them are toxic, some of them are very expensive or difficult to get hold of, and of course upscaling um, is a classic problem in materials development. But with increased um, uh, research and investment in this area, I'm very confident that we'll start to see these materials in our built environment in the future. So that's me done. We'll take questions in the panel. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, so yes, quite, quite a lot to uh, get our heads around quickly there, uh, and some seem really kind of near and some seem further out, but we'll come back on that. Next up is uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Hodge, Research Associate at the Cambridge Graphene Centre and the Engineering Department of Cambridge University. Uh, Cambridge University Nanomaterials and Spectroscopy Group in the Electrical Engineering Division. That's quite a long title. Um, now Stephen works on scalable production and applications of graphene and other layered materials. Uh, he's worked on producing conductive graphene inks, and an example of that is in the supermaterial exhibition. It's the, uh, the panel with the drum kit thing, and you kind of hit it, and it makes different drum noises. Um, and, and, and I presume he'll explain that in, in, in his talk. So he's going to discuss the properties of the world's first two-dimensional material, graphene, and how it can be applied to the built environment. So, Stephen, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Lewis. Um, so yes, uh, I'm not sure how much uh, you know about graphene. Um, so I'd like to just start with going through some of the properties of this uh, super material. Uh, we hear about it a lot in the news. Uh, there's a lot of uh, money going into the research of graphene, trying to drive it to the market. And now this is where uh, a lot of uh, effort is going in. So I want to just highlight uh, today just some applications in the built environment looking at graphene in, in conventional bu building materials, uh, but also looking at how we make uh, interactive lighting and displays, uh, and also interactive walls, which you can have a play with uh, later. So this is our, our starting material. It's, it's graphite, which is naturally found all over the world. Uh, so we can buy it very cheap. You obviously use graphite pencils. Uh, so when you're drawing with your pencil, you're actually making uh, multi-layers of graphene, which you can actually use uh, and make a conductive circuit. Uh, so this is, the, this is the structure. So what we have is these uh, very layered uh, compounds with very weak uh, bonds between the layers. So we have very weak interactions. Uh, but inside the, the plane, we have very, very strong what we call covalent bonds. Uh, so when we are drawing with a pencil, we are uh, allowing these layers to slide over each other. Uh, and we call this an exfoliation route. And you may have uh, seen that if you use scotch tape, you can actually uh, peel this layer down in, uh, until you find one single layer. And when we look at the, the physics and the mechanical properties of this one single atomic layer, we have some very uh, unique uh, and outstanding performance. So you may have seen a, a nice cartoon where 
Essentially, if you take a layer of, uh, well, of cling film and you have a, an elephant standing on, on the tip of a pencil, uh, this is, a, this is a, a cartoon of the actual strength of, of graphene. So it's a material which is around 1,000 times stronger than steel. Okay? Uh, but how do we then turn this uh, single layer of atoms into something we can actually physically use uh, and, and harness? Uh, so another important aspect is, is the conductivity. So in nature, we have all these uh, different types of material. We have insulators, semiconductors, metals like uh, copper and silver and gold, and then graphene. So this is a representation of the electronic structure. So if you imagine this, this red colored part is, is electrons in our material. So to get an insulator to conduct, we need to move these electrons up here. So it needs uh, a lot of energy, so you need to apply a very high voltage, or we can use lights to give uh, energy into the system. Uh, so semiconductors have a slightly smaller gap, which, we, which is called the band gap. Uh, metals are always conducting, so we have uh, free-flowing electrons up and down. Uh, but then graphene has this interesting structure. It's, it's a triangular structure, but actually we have very good uh, movement of electrons, so we always have a, it's basically a, a conductive material, uh, but also it can behave as a semiconductor. Um, so in terms of el electrical conductivity, it's around 10 times more conductive than copper. And in terms of thermal conductivity, so how fast it can dissipate heat, again, this is significantly higher than copper, and it's one of the most uh, thermally conductive materials uh, that, we, that we know today. Uh, in terms of how fast these electrons can move in the system, uh, if we think of a conventional electronics, every electronic um, uh, has a silicon chip. Uh, and in, in that silicon, uh, we have electrons moving uh, around a thousand times slower than in graphene. So if graphene can be uh, integrated into existing electronics, we can uh, make things run much faster uh, and consume less power. Uh, and the other interesting uh, feature of graphene is we can absorb all wavelengths of light. So because of this nice structure, it can absorb every single color light, uh, and that can be integrated into many different applications, for example, telecoms or uh, we'll go into uh, a few details later in, in building materials. Another important aspect is for something which is so thin, so it's uh, 10 to the minus uh, 8 centimeters thickness, we can absorb around 2% of light for each layer of graphene, and that's a huge amount for something so small. Uh, but in, in other applications where we want to absorb 100% uh, of, of light, we can actually uh, pass light across the surface of graphene uh, this is important in, in telecommunications applications. Uh, we can absorb a, the whole amount of light in a very short amount of space. OK, so we have all these interesting properties, and we have a whole uh, playing field of applications where we can e exploit. Uh, so high strength, uh, high conductivity, very good mechanical stability. Uh, but the issue is how do we take this one layer of uh, this one layered material into something which we can handle? OK, so typically what we do, we, as I said, we start with graphite. Uh, we can actually implement it into materials like cement just by mixing or smashing apart the, the, the graphite. So if we just put graphite into cement, and this is looking at uh, when we cure the cement, uh, after one day we have all these, uh, if we look under a very powerful microscope, we see these kinds of uh, needle-like crystals. However, if we turn the, the graphite into graphene, we end up with a much more dense uh, packing of these crystals. And so this actually enables us to make uh, the cement around 50 times, 50% uh, stronger. And also it helps us speed up the curing process so we can uh, cure the cement in, in a week rather than a month. Okay, so that's one uh, important application where just adding a little pinch of uh, graphene as an ingredient, uh, you can really have a big improvement in your final properties of your, your composite. Uh, now this is one example uh, of, of a church built in Rome. And this is using another material called titania. Uh, and so what that does is that absorbs uh, UV light, so from the sun. And actually, it makes some reactions with uh, pollutants or dirt particles, which uh, attach to the surface of the, of the concrete. Uh, and then you can actually break down this, the, this pollution. Uh, so we can look at reducing smog. Uh, and it eventually, uh, well, keeping your buildings nice and white and clean. Okay. Uh, so we've done lots of tests in the lab, and we've looked at this uh, titanium material. Um, of course, this, this is a material which only absorbs UV light. Now we can introduce graphene, and we can, we can look at playing around with uh, using uh, indoor lighting so we don't have to uh, rely on the sun. We can, we can introduce uh, graphene into 
indoor uh, building materials, paints and things. Uh, and we can really enhance this, what we call photocatalytic activity. So we can, again, with a small amount of, of graphene, we can really uh, boost the, the performance of other conventional materials. Uh, and so that we are working uh, with Italian concrete manufacturers to, to do this. Uh, my research is, is focused on conductive inks. So again, taking graphite, smashing it uh, into a few layers uh, in, in water or any solvent. Then we can play around with making circuits. As I mentioned, you can, you can do this with your pencil, but with a nice uh, fluid ink, we can print using many different techniques. Uh, so upstairs, you'll see uh, uh, behind our poster is, is this conductive circuit. Uh, so when we touch each of the, the pads, we have a, a capacitive uh, sensing of, from the graphene, and we can play sounds, or we can, we can make some other interesting, uh, interesting things happen. But in the lab, we're developing all kinds of sensors. I have a few videos. Uh, th this is the poster upstairs, which you can have a play with. Uh, we can make things which you can't do with conventional metals. So this is a, a strain sensor. Uh, so when you bend uh, graphene, graphene-based materials, you're changing and playing around with the resistance. So we can uh, monitor that as a uh, change in, 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 in the strain sensing. So these can be implemented in, into wearables, maybe clothing, or uh, again into uh, building materials. If you want to monitor uh, buildings before they, they crack, you can, you can do a simple resistance measurement. Um, and we're trying to integrate other kinds of electronics into the, into the building materials. This is another application using graphene here is a transparent material. So it's a sandwiching uh, what we call an electroluminescent material, which is lighting up blue when we apply a voltage. So you can see, you can see right through the device. Uh, so graphene is transparent on the bottom and transparent on top. So we can uh, use this property that uh, even when it's very thin, we have very good conductivity. Uh, and the last one I want to show is using graphene in flexible displays. So this is work that we did a couple of years ago now with a company in Cambridge, Flex Enable. Uh, so we have a, a, a printed layer of graphene on the back electrode. Uh, and this is just showing uh, when you flex the, the device, it's, it's not changing. Uh, we have uh, very good uh, performance of the, of the display. And again, this can be integrated into any curved structure or uh, any wearable device. Um, but at the moment, we, we've just developed electrophoretic displays like your Kindle, uh, black and white uh, inks. Uh, and now we're hoping to develop uh, color displays which are flexible and, and more robust. Uh, but again, alongside this needs to come other developments, for example, flexible batteries. Graphene has an important part to play in, in energy storage devices. Um, so again, yeah, harnessing these properties is not easy to do, but uh, we're hoping that over the next five to 10 years, we can uh, start to see some of these applications coming, coming to the market. And uh, yeah, hopefully you'll all be holding some graphene products very soon. So with that, I'd like to just finish. And again, I'll, I'll take uh, questions during the panel discussion. Sure, so we have another graphene product upstairs as well, which is in the, in the painted surfaces, and there's some graphene in there, and perhaps we can, it's not one of your products, but it's interesting how it, it changes the property of the paint quite considerably. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Jessica Wade, a research associate at the Faculty of Natural Sciences and the Department of Physics, Imperial College, London. Her research is focused on creating circularly polarized organic light emitting diodes. It's won many prizes, including such as the Tyndall Prize, uh, the Institute of Physics Early Career Communicators Prize, um, and the I'm a Scientist, Get Me Out of Here, whatever that is, uh, the IOP Jocelyn Bell Burnell Award. And throughout her career, she has been involved in projects to support gender inclusion in science. At Imperial, uh, Jessica established the Imperial College London Women in Physics Group and nationally sits on the Women in Science and Engineering Young Women's Board. So over to Jessica, please. Hello. Okay. 
That made me sound incredibly impressive, I promise I'm not. I went to an incredible TED talk the other day about feeding the city and how we could actually do this when all in 2050, 75% of people will be living in the city and there'll be 12 billion people then. And Tim Anderson, who's an incredible chef who won MasterChef, started with this quotation about cities from Salman Rushdie. And I thought it was really beautiful about how cities aren't permanent, they're always changing, and we can adapt them and we can shape them. And I guess the people in this room are the people who are going to do that. So what do I do in my research? I'm not as clever as Anna. I can't talk about loads of different materials that I haven't researched. So I'm just going to talk about materials that I have. I'm largely focused on, or my PhD was largely focused on solar and how we can find new materials for organic solar cells and develop them. And why we were doing it at all was because the world is warming up. So until recently, all of this data was freely available on the um, NASA website. I don't know how long it will stay up there, but this is the global temperature rise over the past 100 years, <coughs> which fluctuates and then gets very terrifying pretty soon. I sped it up. So the world's getting hotter and hotter, as everyone knows, and we're not actually using much solar energy at all. And the reason we're not is lots of different reasons. One is because they're really, really ugly. So solar panels currently are really, really hideous things and people don't want to have them on their houses. They're incredibly labor intensive to make. It takes almost as much energy to make them at the moment as we can get out, especially in this country. They're really, really expensive and they're hard. They're physically really hard st structures. And we had a bit of an introduction into flexible electronics and where we could go with it, but people aren't doing it. And if they do it, they're putting them on their houses and on the roofs of their houses only facing south. There's also massive political issues with implementing this. But despite everything, there's a $42 billion industry in solar at the moment. And we can, we can harness this and we can change it. So what we're trying to do in the Center for Plastic Electronics at Imperial is to try and make it cheaper, to try and make it flexible. And we're doing that using plastics. So we're using these plastic materials to make the solar cells out of them. And we're depositing them on plastic. So it's kind of double plastic whammy. How they're different, I'm happy we've had the introduction to semiconductors and I don't need to do that, but how they're different to the inorganic semiconductors that you're familiar with. So in basically every device that you guys have in your pockets that we have now are silicon inorganics, inorganic materials. The bonds in these things are really, really strong. So they're really, really tightly bound, all the atoms in these crystals. And so we have to take them up to really high temperatures and pressures to be able to process them, hence the massive cost and also the reason that we can't print them onto plastic because we'd melt the plastic that we're trying to put them onto. But we use them all the time, so they're used in everything. And actually, that band gap that we were talking about before, that gap to make the electrons jump up from this bottom level where they're not conducting to where they do conduct, is perfectly tuned for the sun's light. So it's a tiny bit frustrating for people working in plastic electronics because we don't have that. So we don't have this perfect tuning. What we do have is this arrangement of small molecules and polymers that look like this. For those who are chemists or remember chemistry or have studied it recently, all of the lines in here are carbon bonds. The double ones are double carbon bonds. And what's really, really important for this, and I'll tell you a bit more about how cool the bonding is in a minute, but is that you have single, double, single, double, single, double bonds in this chain. And the brackets mean that we repeat these units loads of times. And they have these kind of hideous chemical names that no one ever calls them by, and then these catchy little acronyms that we know them by in the lab. And we use these because they have a special kind of carbon bonding that gives them this conductivity. So conventionally, plastics can't conduct, right? They're that massive gap that we were looking at before. The bonding in these things allows them to conduct. They're much weaker, the bonds, so we can, we, can, we, can, ah, we can dissolve them in solvents and make conducting organic inks. And then we can tune everything about them by changing their chemistry. So by changing the arrangement of the atoms, by putting a nitrogen in, by putting a benzene in, by shifting things around, we can change the color that they emit or the color that they absorb. So if anyone's seen an advert for a Samsung OLED display or a Galaxy phone, they have organic light emitters in. So the colors there are really, be really beautiful. The blues are really blue. The blacks are really black. And that's because it's using chemistry to control what they put out rather than a filter in front of a white light. So it's really, really exciting. Also, as we've alluded to, all of this science is super new. Actually, every material we've spoken about today has probably been invented within what, like the past 30 years. And so the people who develop these things are still alive. 
and every discovery you make is super exciting. I think that's what's really exciting about this research is that everything you find out is new, but you can also go and ask the experts who actually made it. So we went to the, the business, the company in Cambridge, who have done incredibly well out of making all of these polymers. And the number plate on his car was F8TFB. Check it out. I was so happy by this. You can see, I had to take a photo of it. So happy by that. So what's actually happening in that? So we can make these conductive organic inks, we can print them on plastics, and we can make a whole kind of cheap disposable and flexible electronics, which is super exciting. What's actually happening in the bonding? I didn't know what level to pitch this at, so we'll just go with this. There are six electrons in carbon. They arrange like this. There's a kind of lower energy level, one slightly higher up. The two level splits, which baffles people beyond GCSE, but uh, it's okay, we can take it. The second energy level splits, there's four electrons in there, but two of them sit in this 2p orbital at the top. Three of them then come down to the same level and leave this one little unhybridized PZ electron. And if you do remember this from chemistry, it's these little figure of eight things. So I never believed in them when I was at chemistry A level. I just thought, that's ridiculous. Why is my teacher drawing this on a board? But these figure of eights are basically why these things can conduct. Because the electrons in here are completely homeless. They don't belong to any carbon atom. And they can run up and down the chain of polymers. Or in benzene, which is the one that people are probably familiar with, it can move all around this plane. So you can get conductivity happening because everything in this chain, this electron, can move along and down and up and between it. What you may think, if you are a chemist, is these bonds are really, really weak, so they'd make rubbish solar cells or rubbish light-emitting diodes because when you put them out in the sun, they'd break, or when you inject loads of charge, these bonds would break. So loads and loads of our work is looking at how they degrade. So what happens when you leave them in the sun? What happens when you leave them in UV light? What happens when you heat them up? So we get to arrange fancy pieces of kit to be able to study those. And it is super exciting. So how do you actually build one of these? You've seen one of these kind of sandwich structures before in an earlier slide. But you have these layers, right? So you have an electrode at the bottom. You have your organic material. You have a transparent electrode, crucially, if you want to make a solar cell. And then you have your plastic surface on top. And the sun shines on it, forms this bound state of a pl plus and a minus charge. And then that's split by an electric field and moves to these electrodes. And that's how you use it. So it's really, really neat. And you can get answers really, really quickly about whether these materials will work. What I'm working on now are these cyclically polarized light emitting diodes, which again is using a really, really cool kind of chemistry. So we're blending two materials, one which is, if anyone does remember chemistry, kind of left and right handed molecules. So one which has a spin in this way, one which has a spin in this way. That's a mirror plane. We're blending it with a polymer, and we're making the polymer emit cyclically polarized light, which is great for displays because it means we get a really, really, really high output without having to put filters in the way. So we can put we can put these filters here, but the circularly polarized light can come out anyway and not have to go through them, and we don't have any losses, which we would do with unpolarized light. And I think we had a demonstration of a really nice flexible light emitting diode before, but this is a stretchable one. So going away from flexible electronics and towards kind of stretchable, this was in Michigan State University, but it's really, really beautiful. Other ones which aren't my research. But this is another application of organics. So obviously, if you wanted to make a solar cell in the window, it kind of goes against having a window. So you want to absorb some of the light. You couldn't have a transparent material that absorbed some of the light that was coming in from the sun. This one's really, really clever. So instead of absorbing the light, it <coughs> absorbs some kind of light. It's an organic salt. It produces another color of light, which is then channeled into an OPV, which is really, really thin and just at the edges. And that's where you get the electricity out. So this material is transparent to visible light, but absorbing the near IR and the UV and pr producing another light that can go out and go into the solar cells. So that's really neat. The other one, I'm surprised you didn't talk about perovskites, Anna. This is like a super smart material. So has anyone heard of perovskites in this room? They're very, very trendy. The World Economic Forum said they're one of the top 10 emerging technologies. Basically, every research group in the world now is trying to produce perovskites really, really quickly. They have incredible efficiencies. They've happened in the past probably about 10 years or something like that. Since they've been invented, the efficiencies have really, really rapidly approached silicon. They are incredible. They're also incredibly dangerous. This thing at the top right, hybrid organic, inorganic, lead halide crystal, means they have lead in. People who work on these things have to have poison tests. It's really, really intense, but they are definitely the future of where we're going. You can spray these materials on. They have crazy efficiencies. We just need to find out how to make them stable, how to make them not degrade all the time, and how to make them not poison people as we make them. One thing 
This isn't a plug. I don't have any rights in this, but my friend has written an incredible book on the science of the city. I don't know if you've seen this. It's a very, very she used to work at NPL as a material scientist. It is a beautiful introduction to how cities work and how science is used in cities all the time without us knowing it. And yes, thank you very much. I will also take some questions in the interlude. Yeah, I really should have worked harder on those uh, chemistry lessons. There we go. Um, that's great. So final speaker, uh, Matthew Wells, director at Technica. Uh, Technica delivers structural and civil engineering design solutions on many projects, including the UHPC concrete stair scheme at Somerset House, which I think has been publicized fairly well. Um, Matthew's going to discuss fiber reinforced concrete and intangible, intangible forms outlining how they can be used to inform the environment at several levels. Matthew. Um, right, having just listened to all of that, this might seem a little bit different. Um, because I'm just going to spend 10 minutes on talking about why, or say how, the, our, a piece of basalt concrete comes to be upstairs, and what it represents in terms of a speculation for us. Um, as engineers. Um, we start off, this is our standard slide, and it's not immediately relevant to um, fiber reinforced concrete. This is ordinary uh, reinforced concrete um, from a year ago, masquerading as concrete from made about 40 years ago. Um, but I start with this slide um, because um, what I probably want to put across is, is, is about the, the the change in supermaterials is, is more about a change of perception taking place rather than the sort of leading edge, making a series of sort of game-changing inventions. That, that, that's what it is for me. Um, and this is just a sort of reminder about what's at stake, um, the kind of timescales that are involved in innovation, um, and an, in an illustration of the sort of continuous present, present, which I believe, if you like, we're, we're making innovation within. Um, I was born in this village 60 years ago. It's, um, it was, at the time, the largest brick um, factory in the world. Um, they were making 18 million bricks a week. Um, and they were reported to the Monopolist Commission. Um, and they decided to diversify. Um, when I was 20, um, I went to work for them on a holiday job. Um, working on this, they decided to diversify. And they bought a patent for um, fiber reinforced concrete. And they decided they'd try and develop it. And we tried to get it to work, um, and we couldn't. And the patent lapsed, and the product went, um, went down the pan. Um, they were destroyed by the um, asset stripper James Hansen five years later. Um, I went on to work as a sort of civil engineer. We couldn't, we couldn't get that fiber reinforced concrete to work. It was glass fiber reinforced concrete. They were looking for improvements of about 15, 20% on concrete um, to make sort of lightweight products, building products. Um, following it through as an engineer in subsequent years, um, we see, see did a lot of precast concrete, a lot of in situ concrete. Um, we see fiber concrete come and go, um, glass fiber concrete. Um, but I think probably the point I want to make is um, there have been a number of innovative products appearing. We've done quite a lot of work on um, uh, timber engineering, variations in timber engineering. And it's only recently that we begin to see that uh, reinforced, uh, that uh, fiber concrete is becoming um, a much more important uh, technology. Um, quite why that is, I'm not sure. I think it is, it is a sort of change in attitude rather than any particular sort of um, event rather than let's say some of the work that, that researchers are doing. Concrete, I, um, uh, I argued at a, a discussion at the Science Museum uh, about six weeks ago that it has, it has several sort of bad connotations going right back through its history. I mean, as we know, it's a, it's a Roman product. They took volcanic ash in Naples. It's a sort of Antony and Cleopatra thing. They were going looking for grain in Egypt. They um, went down in ballast, they tossed this ash out, they found it actually solidified in water, hydraulic cement. Um, and that connotation of sort of worthlessness, 
um, cheapness and sort of heavy dutiness um, has, and sort of degree of criminality as well, actually. Um, if you look at what white lapara means, um, it, it certainly um, it has sort of negative connotations. And it's only recently that the very complicated chemistry that goes with the material is, is, is beginning to sort of have a new appeal and its, its relevance becoming more important because whatever happens, um, it is a product that's sort of here to stay. It um, doesn't have, let's say, very uh, positive uh, sustainability credentials, but it's here to stay and it's how to use it. Um, but it's almost as if um, there, there are a series of things going on um, at the moment which, which indicate that uh, fibre reinforced concrete might be um, one of the super materials that will change things quite significantly. And anyway, this is, this is to discuss what that sort of speculating what that might be. Um, and we have found that it sort of like applies to certain incidents. There's no super material that's going to change things completely. But if we, if we actually are widening the spectrum of what we can do, um, there will be a whole range of super materials that will move along relatively quickly. Um, anyway, this is a project we did at Somerset House. Um, that's the uh, Nelson stair, so-called. Morris Nelson, not Horatio Nelson. Uh, his brother. Um, and anybody who's been in the building centre will be familiar with what, what a Palladian stair is. Um, the architect, Eva Jurickner, proposed a new staircase for their um, east wing, I think it is. West wing. Um, very big staircase, couldn't be made of stone. Um, so we were looking around for what the sort of product might be. Something that's mouldable, very, very thin and very, very light. And came to this. This is a, sta this is a table by uh, Norman Foster and the engineer Alistair Lenkler. Um, it's made out of ductile, which is a very, very well, ultra-high performance concrete um, marketed by Lafarge. Um, it's actually not a structural concrete as such. It's more like a gap filler. It is a super uh, polyfiller uh, intended to pour into the uh, gaps in very large civil engineering uh, structures. Um, but the important thing about it is it's made either with an organic fibre, a polymer, or a metal fibre um, with a very, very high fibre content and a very, very fine cement mix um, and a couple of other things added into it. So it obviously gets a relatively high strength. Um, it's somewhere up near ductile iron. Um, an ordinary concrete will be what? Th C35, C40, structural concrete, uh, ductile iron or metal. Is, is up at about 150, 180, and this will get up to about 140. It's not very strong in tension, um, but it has a very, very low shrinkage characteristic, and it pours beautifully. So that's just a sort of um, stress-strain characteristic. Obviously, all materials stretch and strain. We're obviously all familiar with the... Um, The notching of steel, which gives it a particular characteristic. Um, this is ductile iron. That is ductile. This is down at timber. As we see, there's nothing, nothing in tension there. So it's a very sort of particular material. Um, the fires are very protective of it. They won't let anybody use it, so they give out the design criteria. And we can see there's its strength, it's in tensile strength. Very low safety factor. They're very confident in its, its manufacturing standard. Um, it enables us to make some very, very fine components. So you've got something that's about, as I say, about as strong as ductile iron for about a third of the weight. Um, has to be reinforced. But this is sort of belt and braces. You see quite a lot of French work with the material. Um, tends to be screens, not so much structural stuff like this. I don't think we need to dwell on this too much. Um, Very, very nice. Um, it has a degree of ductility which, which helps with the joints, helps reducing the joints. And as I say, the very, very sort of um, predictability of it uh, makes it very suited to um, very straightforward structural design, three dimensional design. It has a few problems with air entrainment because of the fineness of the material. 
but that just sums up um, what it's like. Um, there were air entrainment problems under here. But it's, it, it's just as I'm saying, I'm, saying there's a, I'm suggesting there is a notion that, uh, yeah, reinforced concrete, fiber reinforced concrete is potentially a sort of step change away from uh, uh, reinforced concrete. We should start looking at it again. This probably illustrates something about its pouring characteristics. It's sheared twice. Uh, which is unlike an ordinary uh, ordinary concrete. You'd never do that with a, an ordinary OHPC material. So it pours like plaster of Paris. Um, it pours very fine. Um, but anyway, about basalt fiber concrete, then uh, there are a number of different fibers you can reinforce uh, uh, cement with. As I say, that um, the uh, Lafarge are, are effectively producing a a concrete with uh, the fiber is not only the reinforcement, but it's most of the aggregate. Basalt fiber concrete, uh, the basalt fibers are uh, very strong, very compatible with the base material, um, and you get a very, very sort of, uh, um, again, a very uh, surface resistant concrete. It doesn't uh, mold quite so well, um, but it's gaining similar sorts of strengths. Um, so anyway, we've, we've put a piece of it up upstairs for a, um, so you get a direct encounter with it. It tends to be used in cladding panels at the moment, um, replacement cladding panels, um, slightly weaker, but you can get it up there. Um, but in terms of supermaterial and its practicality, it's actually coming back from ductile. It's weaker than ductile. It doesn't work as well as ductile. It's much, much cheaper than ductile. Um, and so we set up a panel up there, and we're just trying to speculate on what it might mean and how it might be used. Um, and that, I think, is, is probably um, what us, uh, engineers, practices, and designers, rather than researchers, are all about. We don't even need to say what we want from it. We're just looking at it. It's, it's our plaything, actually. It's for us. Um, that's obviously um, the sort of st the structural analysis of the thing, how it's kind of working. Um, I couple this with sort of uh, some work of a man I'm quite interested in, Philippe Raum, um, who has been looking at domestic spaces, Swiss architect looking at domestic spaces, obviously seeing that um, we tend to live in a nice sort of comfy, comfortable environment at about 20 degrees. Uh, we probably like living in open plan houses. It's probably better for us. I saw an adver saw a article in the paper just the other day um, um, that we should perhaps sleep in uh, certainly cooler temperatures and we should probably be more active in cooler temperatures and we should only have warmer spaces in certain areas of the house. So the house for, house for seasons in. It's an open plan house. How is that to be achieved? That can only, um, our comfort comes to us obviously through uh, the air directly, but also from the radiant surfaces around us, would it be possible to feel like, use this sort of relatively thin uh, material, which is relatively cheap compared with others, um, and easy to mould, to actually adjust the thermal environment in the physical space remotely from the walls? And that's literally what this little thing is meant to do. We're meant to see whether we can achieve that. Um, so that curve obviously has a focus over here. And it's so like the plan or the notion is that we can, that's a relatively easy thing to model, um, whether that differentiation of volume, but whether it's practical to get off a surface like that operating at a sort of radiant temperature, at a radiant, a radiator's uh, surface temperature of about 40, 40 degrees, um, whether you can get two or three degrees differentiation on it uh, using a black bulb thermometer, which I'm sure some of you have seen. Um, and of course, there's a ubiquitous app to help us along. Um, there it is the other day in place. Um, we haven't heated it up, we haven't done the test, but we're going to. But the idea is that his head is in the focus, although he's closer to it. He's warmer. And as obviously, this, I, don't know, I, I don't even know how these walls might look, how this roof might look. But the suggestion is... It's a terrible slide, but there was a time when uh, panelled rooms were all the rage, and there might be another time when we won't be using sort of wet trades anymore, just panelled rooms. Obviously, this is an example. Um, 
We didn't do the analysis of this thing. We did all the fixings to the wall and so on and so on. This is nothing to do with radiant surfaces, but that's the kind of space you can get with... Um, some of this is GRC and some of it's um, GRG, gypsum. But all the... All, all the uh, here we are sorting out the, uh, the fixings and so on. That's all fixed. That's all ready to go. Couple that with uh, relatively straightforward radiant modeling. Um, sort of thing you see in a lot of PhDs at the moment. And what I'm speculating on is this is a, this is a conference centre we're doing at um, the NMA, National Memorial Arboretum. Um, very simple, straightforward building, but very open plan. And with a lot of different, different spaces all underneath one roof. And this is suggesting that we're going <coughs> to... It might be possible to actually... Um, work the soffit so we would actually decide what we want to see here at this level and using a grasshopper program we would just um, model that uh, that rhino surface to something that we could uh, make that would help us differentiate the spaces in a way we'd want to and in conclusion there's this, this slide that we uh, we put up out there which is all about um, these are caustics in space we all know what uh, caustics are, but uh, there's a lot of work being done on, on um, uh, the practical application. There is such a thing as a caustics engineer, apparently. Um, this is more to do with computer graphics and uh, the film industry. But it will be possible to actually model the intangible parts of this space. Once you can do that, um, it then becomes you know, a, a real prospect that you could optimize them probably the incommensurables all at some kind of level. And then you will get perhaps a slightly um, different architecture. Thank you. Could I invite you all to, uh, to take a chair on the, on, the, on the high table here? Thanks. So we'll have some time for questions. Um, just to kick things off, after a question all your way. Um, after having been responsible for putting four very expert but different speakers together, uh, I'm just wondering if you heard things from each other that maybe make you think, well, there's an idea. I, I, could, I could work with that in some way. So I was wondering, for, for example, um, you know, graphene is, is you mix graphene with everything and it improves your cornflakes and everything. But, but to, so did you hear anything, anybody else there thinking, you know what, maybe graphene in concrete would do something more? improvements of reinforced concrete and uh, what you're trying to achieve. But I wondered if, if cost was a big uh, issue. So for example, at the moment, graphene is not the cheapest material, but concrete is obviously very cheap. And uh, is there, I, I don't know if there's, you said there's different grades of uh, yeah, expense in concrete. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I think the point I was trying to make was it's almost like the practical application of fiber concrete is coming back mm -hmm. from the extreme research end of it. And the recipe for ductile is super secret. And I'm almost sure, having heard what I've heard tonight, they put some graphene in it. Or something. Um, or something, yeah. 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 And it is that kind of not, not marginal work. That th there's two things going on there. There's the chemistry of the, the actual concrete. Um, and I'm talking more about, or have been talking more, I believe, about the sort of uh, mechanical properties, the actual mechanical attributes of uh, the reinforcement in it. But the pure chemistry is the, certainly the difference between this ultra-high performance concrete and a basalt concrete. But don't you have to put like homeopathic levels of graphene in it anyway to... So it, it depends on, uh, yeah, again, you're always balancing different properties, but uh, as I showed you, with 1% with of, of graphene material, you can improve uh, up to around 50% uh, compressive strength. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it depends on... Uh, how far you want to go. I mean, there are issues with mixing graphene with anything because you need to make sure they're chemically compatible. Uh, so just putting graphene in cement may cause a disaster. You end up with pockets where you have lo lots of graphene and areas where there's nothing. So you're not spreading this uh, mechanical reinforcement throughout the material. Uh, so you have, you'll have very weak spots and very... Uh, that tends to be the classical spots, problem. So but I, I, I mean, one thing I'm kind of interested in, the actual... Um, semantics of things are changing. I, I hear when you go on the site, we always used to mix concrete and batch it, and now they're talking about the dosages they're putting in the actual 
mix. Very low dosages of all sorts of plasticizers and things. Anna, can I bring you in with, you, you, you did a wonderful little tour of a number of things at the beginning there, and some seem further out than others, but I was wondering if there was something there you thought as you were putting your presentation together, you know, I really don't know why this hasn't taken off, why this hasn't got further, this is such an easy, this is what, this should be happening now. Was there something which you, you want to sort of emphasize there that, that this, this industry, the built environment really should be moving faster on? Yeah, I think um, one of the major hurdles is to do with probably public perception. So for example, the, um, the, f the photochromic glass, so the one that darkens in reaction to sunlight, um, that's a very known technology. People use it in sunglasses all the time. Um, but I wouldn't want that in my house because I want to be able to control the light levels. So those kind of applications are, um, although, although it works, there, there's a public perception issue there about why it perhaps hasn't taken off as well as it could have done. So that's something where it needs a bit more development, to, or does it need to, because you can't really change people to, it's still going to be a problem unless they change the product in some way. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's inherent to, to the problem. Or yep. It's inherent to the material that it's perhaps not so suitable for, for windows in houses, but um, it depends what your priorities are. So it could go in a skylight, for example, where people aren't so concerned about being able to see outside, that kind of thing, mm. yeah. I guess most of them are political, though. Like, I really do think that most of these technologies could completely take off if they had the backing and support and m money and also people behind them saying, we need to do this. But instead, it's much easier to use oil and gas. Yeah, actually, reminds me, I was, I was speaking this afternoon at, uh, with a slightly different hat on at a thing called the Economist Sustainability Summit. And I was listening to some of the other talks. And the environment editor of The Economist slightly surprised me by sort of a, talking about energy with people. And um, she's saying, well, the problem is you, know, you can't make money in energy today because the renewables have moved, ruined the pricing of energy. Uh, so it's bad news, clearly. <laughs> and so renewables, bad news because you can't make easy money in energy. And therefore, nobody wants to invest in energy. So we're kind of stuck with that scenario. Uh, and they even said at that, some point just after that that, um, well, you know, if, if you, you know, if it was possible to have 100% renewable energy, is that something we'd want? So that, but, you know, I was thinking, well, hang on. If we don't have 100% renewable energy, we're not going to be around in time. So but th th this, this business focus is very different. But clearly, this is the real world. This room was full of uh, venture capitalists and, and related kind of people. Uh, and that's what's going to actually come in behind an important technology and make it take off. So yeah. is there something which actually does seem to be a more obvious uh, business opportunity? I mean, clearly, Graphene is getting good funding. Um, it is, but yeah, I mean, it, it goes to the, the big companies, they, they have existing technologies, they have uh, existing ways of making materials, and to adopt a new technology, they need to throw out all their old machinery and bring mm. in new yeah. techniques, and it's a big investment for companies to take on. And, uh, Cambridge have loads uh, of nice kits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, the paint we have upstairs, that yes. graphene stone have yeah. uh, put in that. Uh, but basically, they're representing a Spanish paint company because they've worked well, a Spanish company that makes graphene, and they've worked out a way of making graphene sure. cheaper. But you presume you know these guys. I'm sure it's a small world, the graphene world. Yeah, yeah at the moment. Um, but they apparently have worked out a way of making graphene cheaper than we make it here, and as a result, they're applying it to things more extensively. Is that yeah, well, I mean, so it, for graphene in particular, it's, it's the, the easy things to go for. The low hanging fruits are more of the mechanical reinforcements, and uh, it's just adding a, a pinch of graphene as an additive to improve the performance of an already existing material. Mm. Uh, it's where trying to compete with uh, electronics industry. So silicon has been around since the 1950s. It's, it's a very uh, established, very well-known technology. Uh, so we, we cannot just replace it directly. Uh, we need to try and somehow integrate our new materials with uh, existing technologies. And again, companies see graphene as, you know, maybe it will contaminate their factory and they'll have to shut down. And they, you know, they, there are maybe they are scared to, to change, uh, you know, on a really working technology. Um, I think what's really neat about everything, though, is how good we are in this country at doing it. We're really good at making graphene. We're really good at coming up with these great polymers and these great materials. And yet, the companies that really, really succeed, the one that we get all our polymers from in Cambridge, has just been bought by some massive Japanese complete takeover of all of these chemical companies. And I just think... We're losing that. We're so, so good at this research. We get to that edge where we're so, so good and almost being able to translate it, and then something stops it. 
and these amazing things like Flex Enable is still going, but there were loads of spin outs from Cambridge and yeah, Imperial yeah, and Oxford. Yeah. But o the Oxford Perovskite group is smashing everything. They've had huge, huge investment, millions of dollars, and it's, it's going to be big. So, so, why, so why is that going to sort away with investment? Where because not everyone is on it now. I think that the rapid development in efficiency over such a short period of time, we've had organics, we've had polymers since probably the 70s. We've got to about 12, 13% solar cell efficiency, which is all right. In organics, solar cells are on about 25%, but perovskites in the past few years have gone up to like 20, 21%. So as soon as we've sorted out that stability thing, like we're flying, that is it. It does sound a bit of an issue, that. The, the lead is a massive <laughs> issue. Yeah. I, I refuse to work on it, but... No, but again, I think the existing technology is very cheap. Uh, existing, yeah. rigid, uh, ugly solar panels. Yeah. Uh, and every time that it's almost cheaper. about to happen, they make rigid, ugly solar panels cheaper because they're all made in China. Yes, exactly. They drive the cost. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a question. That's uh, uh, the back there. Um, yeah. Could you wait for the microphone? Because that, that helps everyone. Two, two comments and then maybe and one question. Uh, first comment is, uh, you, you didn't talk about smart materials, you talked about responsive materials. You didn't intrinsically responsive materials. You didn't talk about smart materials, which have to be in the system. Uh, second point would be, for graphene, I can see that homogeneity is one of the keys because you're dealing with materials at one to ten nanometer scale. And when you use any kind of conventional mixing process, the eddy scales can never get to those scales to allow you to mix. But my question really is to the scientist from Imperial, who is dangerous. She is dangerous. She's talked about solvents. She's talked about plastics, which we're trying to get rid of. She talked about lead. Mr. McDonough would be of a sleepless night listening to that sort of uh, input. Because the key about a building environment here is the human at the center of activity. And that really means it's not the effects that do the talking, it's the benefits. And you didn't hear too much about the benefits, but these are dangerous effects you're talking about, oh, and you've got to change it? that. Well, I think Jennifer will like come back on that one. Um. So we're, we're, we're using nanometer thicknesses. We're using kind of tens of nanometers. The, the amount of plastic we're using is absolutely tiny. The benefits are low cost, right? So we're using polymers. We're processing them in a completely different way. We're using tiny, tiny amounts of them, so they're ultra light. We can print them onto ultra thin layers of plastic. We're really not using enough for it to be dangerous for anything. And the solvents we're using are largely non-toxic solvents. We, we process them, right? A lot of these people, are, I mean, everyone is still alive, so. <laughs> I think, I, I genuinely think that it is uh, sustainable, renewable. We can, okay. I mean, we can, we can print these things out onto massive ultra thin sheets, right? They're much more, I, I, I disagree with you, but I'm, I'm glad you made it your point. Okay, moving on, we have a question here. My name is Richard. I have a similar question, I guess. I get a question that um, links or builds onto that. And I, a lot of the work that I do is looking at both the longevity and the scale of the built environment. And my question was on, is there enough attention put on developing materials that have the longevity? And you mentioned stability. That means that uh, manufacturers would be able to warranty them for long enough for them to become truly attractive in the built environment. Who wants to tackle that one? I mean, uh, <laughs> in terms of the, the graphene materials, I mean, we, we uh, I mentioned we commercialize graphene inks, which people can take and they can buy off the shelf and print uh, their own circuits. We, we, our inks certainly are stable for a couple of years. We have, you know, stuff in the lab which is uh, still performing exactly the same uh, one or two years after. Uh, yeah, but then putting it in the real world, uh, these tests still need to be done. It's still early days. Um, 
in the lab, we kind of have some crude systems to do some uh, environmental testing uh, of our devices um, in the humidity chamber or high temperature. Um, but yeah, then it's, uh, it's quite difficult. With these molecules, which are nano size, they're very small. Uh, if, for example, your building material, your building crumbles, and you end up with uh, uh, either graphene or other nanomaterials going back into the into the earth, you, you need to monitor how. It's very difficult to do this monitoring, I think, at this stage. I think most of the research is focused on degradation. So, in when you have an organic light emitting screen or anything like that, you have a glass panel in front of it, so it doesn't degrade. I mean, the Samsung Galaxy phone has OLEDs, but it's glass. So most of the research that we do definitely within these groups is looking at degradation and using these fancy in situ chambers or countries like Brazil are very, very big in printing organic solar cells and they have incredible humidity. <laughs> I mean, you, it's humid there and they're still doing it and they have sensors and arrangements to be able to study it. So there are, everyone is concerned about that. I think also in the built environment, it's not just the materials that we have to question the longevity for. Um, when we design these buildings, we have to design longevity into those as well. So a concrete building will stand for thousands of years, but do we want it to stand for thousands of years? Will we still like it in 10 years, in 20 years? So it's much more, um, even if the materials will last, we have to design them in such a way that the longevity yeah, is, is suitable. But we must also design, in reference to circular building thinking, um, that you can take these things apart. And, yeah, and yeah. if you've got some other dangerous, you know, toxic thing in there, you need to be able to get it away from other things and put it back to where it should be. Um, and kind of educate people, I think, in how to use it. So a lot of what we're talking about, especially with renewable energy, is to be used in the developing world. So the nice thing about a solar panel is you don't need to connect to a grid, right? You can just set it up and get electricity wherever you need it. But you need to educate the communities around how to use it and how to look after it. And that's another big part of it. It's not just whacking on this fancy piece of kit to a new uh, building. It's saying this is how you do it. Anybody else want to ask a question? Um, middle. Thank you. So the question is mainly directed towards Matthew and Anna. Uh, a big part of the talk is supposed to be about how, as the built environment, we can respond to material innovation, so the, the, the benefits it can have for the built environment in particular. And I've done some research myself on fiber reinforced concrete. It was a high, high performance fiber reinforced concrete. And I was, well, first of all, it's if you, asking if you've heard of it and um, I know much about it. It's engineered cementitious composites. And it's essentially, it's a, it's a concrete that's ductile uh, after first yield. So you can, you can gain up to 5% tensile strain capacity in the concrete. And it's also got controllable cracks. So you're talking about 0 0.1 millimeter cracks. So when you were talking about self-healing earlier on, then the, the cement particles can hydrate with moisture getting into them as well. So a material like this, like it's, there's still a lot of research going into it, but because of, because of how it's formed, you can use it for also self-sensing applications and things like that. And I, I was just wondering if you've heard anything about it. And, um, and yeah. Yeah, so fibre reinforced concrete, you probably know more than me, but um, my two senses, um, uh, uh, glass fibre, if you're talking about glass fibre reinforced concrete, um, that can be made slightly translucent because light can travel down those fibres. And also the, the refractive index of glass changes when you strain it, so when you, when you bend it. Um, and so in that sense, fibre reinforced concrete can be used to sort of self-monitor as well, so you, it will be able to sense any sort of stress and strain in the structure as well. I do think there is a sort of point being missed here, and it, it, it's, what's it to do with it? Sort of the, the question is is whether longevity is taken into account in materials. No, it's not. Not really. If it passes a sort of 
60 year test, nobody's really bothered about whether it's going to do 120 or 90 or any other 200 years, unless it's a sort of nuclear power yeah, station. Sorry? Yeah, maybe. It's such a massive amount of construction and put in in the UK and across 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 the world. I think part of it's the maintenance cost or things like produce and inspection programs and things like that. If you have a more durable material, then the cost that you see it's, a, it's not about the thing like or anything like that. It's more about reducing life cycle costs. So what are we trying to save? We're trying to save the embodied energy of the first use or the total embodied energy of the final use? To be honest, I think personally think that is probably going to be another, let's say, major step forward in the next 10 years. Proper structural monitoring of the kind you described doesn't really take place either. I know it's, it's, it's easy to implement, and that, what would you call it, that, just that simple data would literally transform what, what we try to make in terms of high-performance concrete. Because it's going to be concrete, that's it. So if we can reduce its use, well I, well, I can't remember the statistic for the, the carbon the carbon dioxide production in the world. It's five percent. Five, yeah. I was going to say. Three or five, yeah. yeah. Some people say five. But if you kind of just look at the map of China, you know, ten years ago it was li lychee fields, and now it's just grey, that grey. You know, that's the issue. Any other questions? Earthquake, for example. Um, so, first of all, how long does it take? And second of all, you know, an earthquake is an earthquake; it's not a crack. Um, does that mean the stability of the building is still in, you know, to the extent where it's habitable, or are we saying, you know, it's basically useless using self-healing concrete in instances like that? Sure. So, it's just a question as to what can the technology allow us to do now, and do we need to wait another ten years or so? The short answer is yes, we probably do need to wait <laughs> for 10 years. Yeah. It's still in its infancy, I would say. So um, with that example of the bacteria, um, I think it, it's not quick. So in an emergency situation, you wouldn't rely on it for yeah. to keep your building up, right? Um, I mean, um, I, uh, what's wrong with cracked concrete? Concrete's cracked. Concrete does crack, yeah, you're yeah. right. I guess the it's issue is... It's all cracked all the time. When it will infiltrate into yeah. um, into a steel girder, and then obviously that causes catastrophic failure. So, yeah, might be a bit bigger crack in an earthquake though to the conventional yeah. cracks. Well, the other thing the other thing about the bacteria is that it on, it can only deal with very small cracks, yeah. um, very narrow cracks. So, so uh, yeah, it's kind of a difference whether you need to have yeah. small cracks and self healing, and it's sure. about ten years to digest and you know create. Yeah, and, and the other thing is once you've got that limestone filled in in the crack. If it gets damaged again, it's not going to self-heal, right? It's kind of sort of it can only heal itself once in that area, um, so it's still in its infancy. Yeah. And then I've just got another question on uh, because so 1996 was when I did my master degree, and I actually did it on renewables. I'm an architect, um, and it's interesting to see that actually within the 20 years that have gone by, it doesn't feel that long, but <laughs> yeah, it's 20 years. Um, we're still seeming to be at the same stage as 20 years ago. So when I was studying it for my master's, it was all about you know sputtering systems, so technology that NASA uses. It doesn't seem to feel like it's actually going into the construction industry. So even photovoltaics are not really supported. They're kind of an add-on, but not of any use whatsoever. Uh, there are so many technologies that were, uh, you know, we knew about 20 years ago, but nothing seems to really happen. And I think as an architect, I'm quite frustrated to hear all this, you know, it's amazing and it's very interesting, but it just doesn't seem to 
trickle down into what we do on a daily basis. And you know, if you talk about sort of chromic windows, we actually tried to apply that to a project, and it was said it's got a lifetime span of ten years. Oh and wow, you kind really? of think, well, no one's going to pay for yeah. that, are they? Sure. So, um, kind of where, how fast do we want to progress? And it doesn't seem to progress fast enough. Mm. Um, is that because of our industry, or is it because of your industry, or you know, you're not getting enough money? To I, I was <laughs> trying to suggest it's a sort of Darwinian environment. There's no gaps in the building industry. Actually, buildings are getting built right now, let's say, relatively happily. Obviously, there is a carbon problem, but the buildings are still getting built. So unless unless something collapses, unless something goes wrong, it's very. I went I went to a conference in Estonia. Uh, sort of wood conference, it was about cross-laminated timber, and they've got to replace all those sort of Soviet uh, blocks. They're going to do it in concrete, despite the fact they've got this sort of huge forest, because they kind of have to, because they've got a concrete industry that was left to them by the Russians, so that's what they've got to do, or they think they've got to do it. But cross-laminated timber is, is sort of competitive in this country directly now, a bit more expensive, but they're building more of it here than they'll be able to build in Estonia. It's crazy. It's because it's a commercial, it's an economic situation. It's not a technical problem. The new Institute of Physics building is all going to have smart physics powering it. It's really exciting. It's in King's Cross. If you look it up, they've put loads of kind of various different smart technologies in from like geothermal to clever sensors on the roof and stuff like that. It's really, really cool. But I do think Are it is that Are they going to go open book? Are they what with what they're doing? Yeah. I think they're working with physicists within the country, and lots of them are working with their energy group there, so they can actually do experiments based on what is in the building. If you l check it out, they've been super open about their development plans. But I think it is that stick, that stick between us guys who are just having fun in a lab and then people who are actually doing it and building it. Is there a communication problem as well between scientists and architects? Because a scientist <laughs> just doing what they think is interesting and yes. building designers <laughs> thinking, well, actually, that's only going to last Or what's going to get published, right? Graphene's great. It's, it's yeah. very yeah. easy to publish. Yeah. It's very hard to work with. Yeah. yeah. I think there are different issues. I mean, obviously, you have a client who has a budget in mind, mm -hmm. and um, we need to sell. If we've got something in mind that's going to be the future, then it needs to be competition. So unless it is competition, they'll regard it as right from the start. Mm -hmm. I think there's probably needs more people in the room, though, um, because you just touched on it here that you know, you've got architects and engineers who are typically fairly uh, creative and open, wanting to do something different, and obviously scientists coming through with interesting ideas. But um, as you touched on, Jennifer, I mean, it's, it's that thing that how do you actually take this and make it successful in industry? And industry doesn't want to change, as Matthew's pointed out. It's got a concrete industry; it can, it can carry on producing concrete. I think um, it's so regulation. It takes, it takes a government, or it takes, it takes you know, bodies maybe that are there to fast track development. So graphene's had a bit of that because people suddenly realized it's really extremely interesting. Um, but other materials may be uh, just withering on the vine, as it were, but not got. Yeah, uh, if there were rules about when, when, you build a, when you design buildings and build them and you have these grades, these efficiency grades, and if you had some regulation in from the government to say you have to use X and, hey, it could be from the UK, that might be really great for both sides. Yeah, definitely. But it won't happen because the government changes every four years. So I'm going to let you get out by eight. There's one more question, I think, over here. Was there one more question over here? You? Yeah. So we'll have another final question, perhaps. Yeah. Um, hello. Hi. Um, first of all, the, I think the panel was fantastic. I think it was, a, it was mind, mind blowing stuff. Really, really fascinating materials and some of the numbers and the scales. And OK, we didn't understand like 80% of it, but it was really, really amazing. And it's interesting to see that you've got a panel of people who are opportunists, people who are looking and experimenting at what can be done. And there's also people like Matthew who are problem solvers. And as architects, we kind of sit in the middle and some might say we cause the problems, but I also <laughs> like to think that we um, help think about things that you might not necessarily think about as a, and in different ways. My question would be to each of you, if you could imagine a scenario, it's a little bit of a creative exercise, a scenario in 30 years, 50 years time where your material or your work or your research has been propelled in its most 
accelerated fashion, what would that be? What would be the dream, as it were? That's a good final question. question. Off you go. Who wants to start? <laughs> you can tell us about what you actually <laughs> research. <laughs> mm. Is it that yeah, fun? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'll start. So, uh, yeah, one of my key interests is, is similar to uh, Jessica, is, is this flexible electronics. Uh, can we make uh, electronics which are environmentally friendly, uh, recyclable, uh, completely flexible, uh, bendable? Uh, if people want that, I think it's, uh, it's not clear if people actually want the flexible, stretchable iPads, but uh, I want one. <laughs> well, my friend, had, my friend had a whole webinar this morning on how wearable tech has been a complete disappointment and no one's actually interested in it. It was an hour long. <laughs> I asked him for the notes so I could tell you about it here. I think going towards bioelectronics for it, I, I know that it's the built environment and that we're not supposed to say that, but, um, but flexible electronics obviously have huge applications within the human body and, and going towards sensors for things like blood pressure and stuff like that is really really attractive for me and so now we're working with bioengineers to make that possible and i think that's super exciting but from a built environment perspective i think making windows functional seems like a really really easy target and we should be doing that more we have we all have these windows we can get these materials that we can put inside them to make them absorb light and turn that into electricity and we should just be trying it and doing it Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't actually research smart materials, so I don't mind being <laughs> controversial here. Um, I worry about smart materials. Um, there's lots of interesting, sometimes philosophical questions we can ask ourselves, such as, why do we want to completely automate our lives to the extent that we can't be bothered to close the blind or close the windows? These kind of things. Um, so I guess I envisage in 50 years, if all the smart materials get crammed into buildings, we're going to be lazy. <laughs> we're going to be <laughs> we're going to be perfectly temperature regulated. Um, You're going to be jumping up on your little piezoelectric board all the yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so it's 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 going to be fascinating to see in the next few years what happens. Um, I mean, that can be extrapolated to all elements of our lives, the way technology is going. Um, yes, I think smart buildings have the potential to be both good and bad. Um, yeah, I'll finish off. I'm the, I'm, I'm the only one on this panel who has actually worked through A30 years. And I can say quite categorically, it doesn't change very much. <laughs> <laughs> what I'd like to see in the next 30 years, I, I, for me, it's not actually the technology explosion. Information explosion is fascinating. I find that fascinating that I could just, I could pull down something that somebody was doing 30 years ago and decide what I think of it. And I'm hoping that in the next 30 years, I'm hoping in the next 10 years, that it will be possible to really start um, making some proper quantifications of what goes on. There is so much nonsense talked, and it will be very interesting to properly, um, what should we say, um, a monitor a building at all sorts of different levels. And that will, that will change yeah. things. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Matthew, are you going to have to sort of show people if they want to talk about your piece upstairs? I shall go past it on the way out, yes. Very good. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> we can talk to Matthew about his actual structure upstairs afterwards. And I'd just like to say uh, thank you, big thank you to everybody who spoke here and indeed all, all you attending. One thing I'd just like to add um, in the information area is it's my gratuitous plug for the new journal that we're doing. And um, I don't think anybody's selling it tonight, but I'm going to plug it anyway. And so the built environment. Uh, Trust has got a new journal after 86 years of all these organizations finally got up with technology and printed something rather than digital. Uh, and I hope you're going to buy some of those. Um, there's actually a launch subscription offer. It's £15 for which you get two issues rather than that's the single issue price normally. Um, so bear that in mind. Next time you're here, buy one, please. It's full of stuff about super materials, and some of the stuff you've heard tonight is in part in there. So um, that's my plug. And thank you for coming. Hope you come to more of the series. Thank you.